Thank you and welcome, welcome, welcome to our fourth series of our virtual lecture series at Evergreen State College Tacoma Campus. We are so delighted to have you all here today. We are really grateful. In fact, this is a day of gratitude. We just heard from Sweet Honey in the Rock We've come a long way to be together. And I just want to show some gratitude for today. You know, today I woke up and I took a bath and I had breakfast. Okay, I know all of you probably did something like that. So you're grateful, but let's just take a moment in the chat. Everyone go to the bottom of the chat in the middle there. I see already 10 notes and many are saying good morning. Before we say another word, let us pause. We're going to go to the bottom of that chat and we are going to acknowledge something that we are grateful for today. And do not click on that chat until we say go. So give yourself a moment to think of what you are truly grateful for today. And type it in the chat. And when I say go, we will reveal what we are grateful for. Okay, are you ready? Everyone click the return button. Let's just see a moment of gratefulness before us. My family in good health, grateful for my work, students at Evergreen Tacoma, Grateful for getting work. Oh, yes. <laughs> Grateful for Evergreen family. Nice weather. Oh, yes. Grateful for abundance of all good things. Thankful for my supportive family to be living right now. Being talked to by Dr. Joy Hardiman today. I am so grateful that I have a reasonable portion of health and strength to continue to work on behalf of Black people. Oh my, to have a roof over my head. <laughs> I am grateful for my elders who guide me with wisdom. I'm grateful for my peace of mind and health. We are grateful for running water, yes, in a dry state of California. Welcome, welcome to the Pacific Northwest, those of you in California. Grateful for this day to be present, to enjoy it. Thankful to be around like-minded folk, oh yes. Grateful for this community and the opportunity to connect during this pandemic. Ashe to that. Oh, and I use those Yoruba words that speak truth when I say Ashe. So good morning, everyone. We are so delighted to have you all with us today on this beautiful, beautiful morning. And I believe we have some special visitors with us today. I am looking for uh, Fatima. Sister Fatima, are you with us? Just speak right into that phone. I think you have to press six. Hey, good morning, Dr. Runga. I am here. Beautiful. You made it. I wanted everyone <laughs> yes. to meet. Uh, Fatima Gordon, she is an elder who, I will say an elder in training. You're just going to be soon an elder in a few years and you have settled in Tacoma and we have just been so gifted with your treasures of, of, of beautiful uh, rhythms, business and your salts and your 
um, all of your smell good things. And I just want you to say good morning and bless us this morning. Yes, I say good morning. I greet you all in peace and love. I'm asking all of us, I'm so grateful that we are here. We have signed up before we were born for this time. And we pour water libation for those wonderful ancestors who paved the way and the shoulders that we stand on. I would say, in this moment, this is an incredible opportunity for us to continue to dream possibilities, to stay vigilant in being dignified and stay in our humanity. Let us, our humanity is a range of feelings and emotions and being. Let us continue to love and treat each other with dignity let us continue to be disciplined in all the things that we would like to create. This is a time for us to reset the patterns. That's why we are here. Let us reset the patterns. If in our lineage, our mother, our father, challenged with drugs, challenged with hardships, challenged with whatever, let us take the energy and the rhythm to reset the patterns for our children and their children and their children. Truly, when we move in dignity, we can sacredly mourn and we can know that this life is eternal and perpetual and we will continue to flow like the river. Let us sing and dance and cry and wail and mourn and do all of the things that we know how to do as African people. Let us have boundaries. Let us have firm boundaries. That's respect. And mostly the love in our heart that we have for one another. This is an incredible time because we remember now that we are the Alpha and Omega. We are the first civilization. And we are living at a time to remember that. So I want to just love everyone in, in my heart. And thank you for receiving me as an emerging elder. And thank you, Dr. Runga. I love you so deep. Peace and love, everyone. And have peace, feel, wonder, feel day. No matter what come up, remember that there's mercy in it. Mm. I mean, I say. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Fatima. What a beautiful blessing. And I just wanted people to get to know her. She is in our Tacoma community. She comes to Evergreen State College with oils and, and salts and bath salts to adorn yourself. And um, thank you for being in our community and being there. And I also see my Thank dear you. friend and, and special guest, Lou Rochelle Brim Atkins. Good morning, Lou Rochelle. Good morning, Dr. Arunga. How are you? Oh, I am awesome. And it is a pleasure to have you with us today. I want people to know that Lou Rochelle Brim Atkins was part of our vision and planning team with Cultural Reconnection for more than a decade. And she made that commitment with us and then went on to continue to take uh, women and men from all over as the president of the, uh, of the uh, sister city. What is that? Limbe, Seattle, sister city. Um, traveling back to Africa with communities, maybe over a hundred people you have taken by now. Lou Rochelle? Well, we take, we try to do small groups, so we take 10 to 12 people. Dr. Hardiman is one of those people who travels with us to Africa, and we take people so that we can connect with the people of African descent in Cameroon. So our sister city is Limbe, Cameroon, but we travel all over Cameroon, and there's civil unrest there now, but we can hardly wait to get back, right, Dr. Joy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This oh, and is wonderful too, Marsha. This is just, I'm just so excited 
to be part of this conversation today and to hear what my sister friend has to say. And this is, thank you for doing this. This is fabulous. You, thank you very much for being with us. And I, and I, I look forward to you being a part of our community, sharing your good work as an international uh, traveler, as a philanthropist. And I saw you on TV the other day talking about uh, defunding the police on behalf of the uh, governor. So keep up that good work. We are among very awesome people today. Another person I'd like to introduce you to is Dr. Orisha Day Awadolo. Oh, I know I messed up your name, Awadola. Is that okay, Orisha Day? Dr. Orisha Day is the director and founder of the Institute of African Thought. Um, Orisha Day, are you with us? She may not be with us, but she'll join us later and maybe she'll even comment on uh, Dr. Hardiman. And so I'm not gonna, oh, but Eric, are you with us? who is my special guest who I invited to talk to us uh, with uh, our special author in residence, who is uh, our lovely Teresa Stovall. If you've been joining in, you've been meeting her. And without further ado, I just want to really honor the fact that we have um, in our midst, <laughs> just royalty, but she has a introduction for herself uh, prepared electronically, because today that's kind of a theme. We're going to show electronics. But I have to say, as the Dean of Evergreen State College, this is my one of my predecessors, one of the people who laid the groundwork for Evergreen State College Tacoma, Dr. Joy Hardiman. She's also our faculty emeritus that is not an easy thing to be. Faculty emeritus is something bestowed upon people with the long years of service that she gave to Evergreen, not only to Coma, but to Olympia. Uh, but without further ado, I just want to, in the expression of great love, introduce Trey. Are we ready for that electronic introduction? And the next voice you will hear will be that of our own Dr. Joy Hardiman. My name is Dr. Joy Hardiman. My students call me Dr. J. I am a scholar, storyteller, world traveler, master teacher, lifelong learner, and higher education architect. I am the CEO of Hardiman House Incorporated, an urban sanctuary that in partnership with my daughter, Salma Ayers Hardiman, expands the mind, feeds the spirit, and restores the soul. I am the artistic director of Ancestral Artworks, a creative production company that uses ancestral wisdoms to explore and envision solutions to contemporary problems. And I am the founder of the Raw Imaging Exploratorium, a coaching, training, and consultant institute that helps people, organizations, and communities reframe their narratives through the recognition and the reimagining of those practices, behaviors, language, and worldviews that block their brilliance. I am appreciated by many for my skills in listening, synthesizing, and energizing. You made my heart full. You, when you're talking about reclaiming, our healing won't come forward until we reclaim our history, our heritage, our identities, all of us. I think that is the key to our own health and well-being as we move forward with all of this turmoil. If I could sum up my life's work in a few words, it would be, I take as my sacred duty to restore that which is in ruin and make it more beautiful than before, to resurrect truth from the chains of falsehood and to applaud the sunrises that come after sunsets. Ashe.
All right. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see your smiling faces out there. Hey, Rob Knapp, how you doing? Um, um, this is, um, mm, uh, what a beautiful uh, beginning. Um, uh, and I, I, I thank you, Marsha, for uh, uh, Dr. Tate Arunga, uh, for this opportunity to come um, to come before my community and to uh, and to share with you some of the foundational stories about the Tacoma campus and and about the kind of social, cultural, spiritual infrastructure um, that I um, that um, that exists there. And um, so. Um, uh, I, I and um, and this is this is a very moving moving time. I I was going to begin differently, but I want to begin with this quote, um, which is I stand before I stand before God at the end of my when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have one single talent left, and could say I had used everything you gave me. That's from Chat with Bowman. And I feel that way about the Tacoma campus. I feel that the Tacoma campus has been my Wakanda. It has been, um, it has been a chance, um, a, 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 a place where I was able to bring um, all the gifts I had and, and use them to the fullest um, in the company of some marvelous co-conspirators. Okay, so let me, um, let me just, uh, I'm emotional. This is very interesting because this campus is not just a building. It's a group of people. It's a community. It's a sacred space. Um, it's a place that's dedicated not to the liberal arts, but to the liberating arts. Um, to the notion of taking all everyone who enters um, and ha helping them r rise from their lower nature to their higher nature. And so, uh, so coming home uh, to the space um, it is it, it, both an act of, um, of uh, humility and, uh, and, and gratitude. So, um, so in, 19, in, in 1972, Dr. Maxine Mims founded the Tacoma campus. Um, and, she, um, and, and her notion was that she wanted to serve the uh, Black community of Tacoma that she wanted to provide access to education. Um, and that was her primary goal. Her primary goal was to say, look, higher education is available to you. It's a welcoming space, come in. I will teach you, even if I have to start around my kitchen table. And, and even if I have to teach you before I get in the car and drive all the way to Olympia and then teach you after I come back. So she had classes from six to eight in the morning and six to eight at night in order to in order to nurture this the nurture this community um, that um, that she called her home the hilltop. Um, in 1977, uh, Dr. Mims got her doctorate agree, degree based on the Tacoma campus. So one of the things people say, oh yeah, it was built around the kitchen table. But what people have to understand is that it was built on deep thought deep, deep thought, reflection, and scholarship. And so Dr. Mims, what she did in her dissertation, she identified five needs that urban Black adults um, needed to, 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 to respond to. One, they had to learn about themselves. They had to study their culture, <coughs> their genius, <coughs> all of those things. Then the second one, they had to study the systems that kept them from realizing their geniuses. They had to look at those practices, those isms, those hierarchies that blocked them, and they had to understand where were the holes, where were the cracks, so that they could put the, you know, get them in and open them up and allow, you know, for uh, for 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 uh, for the genius to uh, to be recognized. And then the third one was that people had to develop a sense of equivalency. People had to, had to um, work within their own communities so that they would have a currency so that they could do the fourth step, which was to come together in coalitions with other like-minded people. And then the fifth, fifth thing was that, was that people had to realize that there were geniuses in the Black community, that the Black community had their own Picasso, that the Black community had their own Plato. We found out later that the Black community had Plato before Plato had Plato, but, <laughs> and she, but and when she was doing her dissertation, we were still Greek oriented. So, and, and that was, and so that was her idea. And, and I think the critical idea that, that she um, passed on to me was the idea of recognizing Black genius. Um, the idea of appreciative inquiry, the idea of not seeing people in terms of their deficits, but seeing people in terms of their assets. Um, 
And so, um, 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 and in night, and so, um, and I came to Evergreen in 1975. Um, and I, and actually I came to Evergreen because of Maxine, because I, um, I was trying to decide whether I wanted to come and I was at the governor's house and, uh, and, and it was like, oh, I don't know if I want to be here. This is kind of weird and I'm strange and this is strange. And everybody kept saying, wait, wait till you meet Dr. Mims. No, she wasn't Dr. Mims yet. She was just Maxine. Wait till you meet Maxine. And I said, okay, fine. And then all of a sudden everybody's head turned and, um, and we looked in the doorway and there was this woman who was dressed in this red jumpsuit and these gorgeous red leather Spanish cowboy boots and a black boa. Um, and I think she may have had a cowboy hat as well. And I just said, oh my God, who is she? I wanna be her, right? And so I said, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, and so, um, so uh, but originally I worked in Olympia because I had been hired uh, at Evergreen uh, um, as a, improvisational theater um, uh, uh, a specialist. Um, and uh, so I was working in Olympia and after, I was working in Olympia for a while and, uh, and, and, I, and, my, and, my, and my heart started breaking. My, my, I, felt I, I, I was missing blackness. I, I was missing community. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I did a documentary on it, which is on my, uh, which is on my YouTube channel, um, Ancestral Artworks, called A Soul Comes Home. They talked in my, about my transitioning, my, my coming back to the black community. So when I came back to the black community, I said, Maxine, I want to teach at Tacoma. I want to, I, I really need to work with my people. I really need to feel like I'm giving my gifts back, that I'm returning back to my community some of the blessings that I've been given. And she said, yeah, but you can't come here and teach, um, teach theater because all people, they, they, they just think black people just sing and dance. And so you have a classical literature background. I did my academic background was classical literature, um, the Greeks to Shakespeare, uh, with a specialty in uh, medieval literature and, um, and, and, and a concentration in 16th century Commedia dell'arte. So I was really westernly trained. Uh, and so she said, you've got to teach classical literature to my students. I don't want you teaching song and dance. And I said, but, but there's all these big retired military men. And, and, and I'm going to talk about Beowulf and Canterbury Tales, and they're not going to know what I'm talking about. And then they won't like me. And I'm an only child, so I have this real need to be liked. you know. And she said, get over it. Um, so she said, find a way to teach my people classical literature and classical disciplines. So God is good because I was reading this book called The Way of the Story, The Way of the Storyteller by Ruth Sawyer. And Ruth Sawyer said in her book, I can't tell you the page, but it was on the right hand side, about halfway down, um, one sentence that changed my life, another thing that changed my life, and it said, most of Western literature has its prototypical um, uh, examples in ancient Egypt. And at that time, it was, a, it was a whole movement where people were finally recognizing that ancient Egypt was an African-based um, civilization um, and that it was, in fact, the classical civilization of Africa. And so, I started studying about ancient Egypt and I got a PhD because Maxine said that anybody that taught at Evergreen had to have a PhD. And um, so Betsy Dippendahl, myself and Sally Rewall, who were all teaching at the same time, we all got in graduate schools and, and, and got our PhDs. And my PhD was in ancient Egyptian literary studies. And my dissertation was, um, my dissertation was, um, the ancient Egyptian autobiographical tradition and its pedagogical value to urban black adults. Because one of the things I found was that in ancient Egypt, because Maxine had always had people write autobiographies as part of the program, because, but she had people write autobiographies and then give them to a member of their family, either living or dead. Sometimes if some, it was a mother, you took your autobiography out and you put it in a cemetery. If it was a child, you took your autobiography and you put it in a safe deposit box until they were old enough to read it. But so she had always done autobiography, but then she said, you have to do autobiography. So my touch was to do them from an ancient Egyptian perspective. And the ancient Egyptian perspective was that you didn't look at your life and you looked at your life, um, uh, instead of looking at your life as, a tra as tragic or the fortunate fall or, 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 or something else like that, you looked at your life in terms of the 
wisdom, the wisdom earned, the lessons learned and the wisdom earned from the hills and valleys of your life. So when, when, you write, you, when you look at your life from an ancient Egyptian point of view, it doesn't make a difference what happened down here. What makes a difference is what did you do with it? How did you use that information? And what, that allowed, what I found out that did was allow the Tacoma students not to see themselves as victims, but to see themselves as victors, seeing themselves as people who could write their own stories based on the lessons learned and the wisdom learned they had. So, um, so, 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 so Dr. Mims and I, um, uh, uh, she graciously allowed me to come and work in the campus and then uh, told me that I was her heir apparent and that, um, and she took me through a rigorous training. Um, we, um, uh, some of us terrestrial knows this, called it being maxine It was a verb, you know, Maxine was not a noun, she was a verb. Um, but, uh, uh, but um, um, and, and I wanna say something very important because people always say, why in Tacoma do you all, all we been call each other doctor doctors? You know, um, uh, and that was because we came into uh, a community that had too long been denied status, all right? That was one of the reasons. And it was really important for people to be in Fred Meyer, to be at, in, um, in, 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 in the store and say, that's my teacher, Dr. Mims, Dr. Hardiman, because then they became, they got the stat, they, they had status as well. Um, and also it's a Southern black tradition. No, no, no child ever calls an adult by their first name. Um, that's considered sacrilegious. Um, they were always Miss, Miss somebody or other, or Mr. Something, Mr. Mr. Jones, Mr. So-and-so, or they were auntie or they were uncles, but they were never by their first name. In fact, I think that's what, where we lost mo a lot of our kids in the K through 12 situ situation, when their teachers came in and said, call me Mary, call me Joe, call me something or other, which meant there was no re necessary for respect. And I used to tell my te teachers, don't let my daughter call you by your first name, because if you, you do, she's going to go toe to toe to toe with you, and you're going to have no control over her. And the woman said, oh, yes, no, she can call me Alice, she can call me Alice. Well, two days later, Alice called me and said, you're going to have to come and get your child. And I said, why? And she said, because she said, I gave her an assignment, and she looked at me and said, Alice, this assignment is redundant, you know, and it was like... So we don't, we call each other doctors, but it's, 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 a, it's a Southern part of respect. You, you address an elder, you, you know, with respect um, um, and you don't call them Mary Jo. So at Tacoma, we are Dr. Hardiman and Dr. Runga and Dr. Mims because our community demands it. Our community demands that we, um, uh, that, we not, that we not be ashamed and that we become a model for aspiration, you know? So, Anyway, um, so 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 I wanted just to make that point. Um, now, uh, so so in um, in 1990, I took over the direction of the Coma campus, and I essentially ran it for about 18 or 19 years. And my, I had two, I had I had a lot of goals, but two of my goals was moving the campus from a building to a block, because when we were on Sixth Avenue, we were on a storefront. And they always put campuses, you know, for, for people of color in storefronts. And I wanted out of the storefront. I wanted a, a beautiful building with parking lots. I wanted parking spaces. That seemed to be, you know, the goal. How many parking spaces you could get with how much status you had. So anyway, I, and also I wanted to create an infrastructure for Tacoma that was not dependent upon personality. Because too often, because if we were talking about building for eternity, we, I, it felt to me it was really critically important that the campus be based on a value system, that the campus be based on, on cultural icons and symbols that, um, that, um, uh, um, that, that, that could support the intention. So it didn't make any difference who ran it. The campus would still be able to sustain itself. And the campus is now 50 years old. So obviously some of those values and stuff like that work really well. So how did we do that? Well, one of the things that's beautiful about um, Evergreen is that uh, it's a co-learning situation. And so, and that students get involved um, in, in deciding their own, not only their own curriculum, but their own destinies and the destinies for their own community. So 
Um, I had a friend of mine, Judith Nyland, who um, uh, ran a graphics and branding and advertising company um, in here in Tacoma, and I had her come in and be a, be a uh, adjunct for one quarter and to work with the students about how do we brand Tacoma? How do we, how, how do we define who we are? Um, otherwise, people will try to define us for themselves. So we had to define ourselves first. So, so, the, so the students basically did research in, 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 in um, uh, classical African um, uh, educational um, systems, traditional African, indigenous, um, African-American, HBCU colleges, et cetera, as a, as a way of, uh, as, a, as, the, as, the, uh, as the, the source for their, um, for their uh, institutional a training and marketing class. And what they came up with and um, was, um, uh, and now Trey, you can show the slot slide of the Sankofa bird. What they came up with was, the, was to have, they wanted an image of the campus that would, um, that would describe, um, uh, that would be a mandate and a pedagogy. So, and, and also very honestly, I hate the gooey duck. I have always hated the gooey duck. I think that's, that's Olympia's ma mascot. And I think it looks like a lip phallus. And it's like, and I didn't, didn't want to see these grown men walking around with this little shell with this little phallus thing coming out of it. So we changed it. We said, no, our image is not going to be the gooey duck. We're, and our image is going to be the Sankofa. And the Sankofa is a Ghanaian symbol. Uh, and, it, and it comes out in two ways. One, the form of a, of a bird uh, with a seed, which has the next generation. That's the next generation. And, and, and so if, in fact, we want to build for the next generation, we must go back and fetch it. We must go back to our ancient ways of knowing, our traditional ways of knowing, the ways of our grandmothers and grandfathers, and use that knowledge to move forward for the sake of the future. And the way we do it is through the heart. You can see the other symbol of the Sankofa, which is a heart symbol, which says we must leave with our heart, not always with our intellect or our mind. But if we're going to go back, the heart is the thing that will carry the spirit. Okay, thank you, Trey. We can go back to me. And then what we, <laughs> ah, hi, me. Uh, okay, and then what we decided to do is we looked and, and we said, we needed to have values. What is the Tacoma campus about? Because what was happening too often, because we said we were a black campus, people thought that meant we were anti-white. You know, and that's because they were locked in dichotomies of, of either or, as opposed to understanding the, re the reality of both and. So we wanted to make sure that people understood who we were and what we were about. So we came up with four values. Um, one of the values was uh, reciprocity, um, which means that, and that was our relationship with the community and with each other. The notion was that we would give and take equally from each other, but we would always try to give back. Um, uh, inclusivity, it meant that within the African um, um, uh, epistemology, all are welcome. It's a both and situation. It, um, it is not high art. It is not hierarchical. It is complementary dualities. Um, and then um, civility about how do we talk with each other that are ways that, that, that are ways that help to nourish who we are. And hospitality. All who come, all who enter, come in. Everyone is just a brother or a sister going to or from home. So we, 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 so we, we design these value systems, reciprocity, in inclusivity, civility, and hospitality. And, and I get, have to give a shout out to uh, the alumni who, um, uh, association who all of a sudden realized that those initials spelled rich and came up and said, that is our curriculum and that's our environment at Tacoma. It's a rich environment based on these values. And then we had to come up with a model and the students really liked the model of, um, that Mary Bacall, um, of Mary Bacall Bethune, uh, Bethune Cookman um, College, uh, her, their school model was enter to learn and depart to serve. And that, is, and, and so, so the students said, yes, that's our model. That's what we need to do. That's what learning, what is education for? It's for service. That's what edu you come to, you're the, to the Tacoma campus. What you will learn is you'll get a lot of information, but the expectation is that you will use that, um, use that, um, that energy for, um, for, um, for, um, 
for uh, for the community well-being. Um, so 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 the value system, the the the, the symbol, um, and the, and the motto. Um, all were um, all were uh, institutionalized, and um, and we use the idea uh, of how it was from the '60s when they used to have posters all over everywhere. So we put the signs up. We put the signs up really big when you walk in, just so you don't forget. This is the rules of this house: inclusivity, reciprocity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also um, we also instituted rituals um, because we know that rituals keep a community together. Um, and so the graduation ritual was one of the very first ones we had. And, and people wonder, why does Tacoma walk at, before graduation? What's that all about? And sometimes it's hot and sometimes it's raining, you know, and we got to walk and get all sticky and our makeup looks, you know, we don't look as cute as we did when we started. The reason why we did that was because in the very early days, um, Dr. Mims thought it was really important that people uh, see themselves um, in as graduates. And usually in, in, in the black community, a lot of times people, the only time they see you with, with robes is if you're in a choir. And in fact, um, uh, when, in the early days when we used to wear our robes all the time, people asked us what selection we were gonna sing. And we're going, you know, we're not gonna sing a song, but we're gonna give you some knowledge and some information. Um, so, so, we, so, what we, so in the early days, what would happen when, when we would graduate, um, there was a place called Brown Star Grill where everybody hung out on, on K Street. And we would um, get our, our, our graduates, we'd, we'd put our, our outfits on and we would walk by, we would walk around the neighborhood. We would walk by Brown Star Grill and people would say, wasn't that the guy that was just here two years ago sitting on that bar stool and now he's graduating? If he can graduate, I can graduate. So it was to show the community the possibility, to show the community that, that this could also be who they were. So that's why we march at graduation. And that's why we have the African drums to beat them, to, to bring the drum back to the community and to say, you know, all is well, all is well. Let's, you know, let's go, let's do it. So um, I'm probably running out of time and I'm still only, um, and, um, and so, 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 huh? Am I okay? You're doing fine. Okay, great. Okay, so, so that was in um, that was in 1990, the year I took over. We institutionalized the the value systems. We 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 put in rituals um, because I had read a book by a, a man named Terry Deal out of Howard who said that rituals were critically important for community well-being, um, and so we said let's do it. But that, but, but, but in, in 2001, we moved from the K Street to the to 6th Avenue. And that was an amazing experience. We did it because of the mandate from Virginia Taylor, and I need to say her name, because she was the mayor of K Street. And she challenged us to become the beacon on the hill. She challenged us to do what, um, what Columbia did not do for Harlem. She challenged us to be, to, to come to the community to restore that which was in ruin and make it more beautiful than before. And so we did. So in spring of 2001, we moved into our new building. Now, Trey, you can show the second slide. So we moved into the new building, but, and, and I wanted to tell you that this building you're in is based, uh -huh, thank you, Ted, I mean, uh, uh, thank you. This building that you're in is based on the Temple Library University of Ancient Egypt. All right, this was a book by a man named Swala de Lubick. And he basically showed that most of the temples in ancient Egypt were anthrop anthropomorphic, that they were based on the human anatomy. And so that you would walk into the, to the little entry, to the entryway, and then you would turn to the, uh, you would turn one way and you would uh, be uh, in the area where the feet are, in the area where the classrooms are. And then if you turn and went up the, uh, went up the other way, you would be in the central hall uh, where, uh, where everyone's uh, gathered together. And as you move up to the head, um, that would be the Holy of Holies. And how the Tacoma campus is designed is you walk into the entryway and you turn, um, and you turn, um, and you turn to the right or left and you go down to the left. Lyce huh? Left? Left. Left. Okay, you turn left and you go down to the Lyceum Hall. 
And the Lyceum Hall was like where all the people gathered together to hear wisdom, to hear what things were going on. And, and, you can, and, and the stage became the Holy of Holies. And so it was like after you had studied and stuff like that, you, you, you'd stay in the Lyceum. But when you got to do your senior projects or your thesis thing, you could go up to the stage and you would be in the Holy of Holies and you would have, would have completed the journey. If you, if you came in and went to the right, then you would be in the classroom spaces. And we looked at the classroom spaces at the feet that gave you the energy that could propel you to move from your, to move from your heart, which was the Lyceum, into your divinity, which was the, um, which was the stage. Um, and so, so it was, so, so, um, and, um, um, and, and, and then we got even funny, we had a great time actually, uh, we uh, decided that there should be, everybody needed, because we had a, made a commitment to inclusivity, everybody needed to have light. So we had light coming into the faculty offices, but we didn't close them off so that the light and the knowledge could flow into the Lyceum. Um, and so it was like a Marrakesh market, you know, an open market. Here are all the faculty alongside with their stalls and their wares, and then they open their doors and students come in and get enriched, or they come out and get enriched by the students. So, so you're, so, okay, thank you, Trey. So you're working, at, so you, what you are um, existing in right now is a sacred space. It's a temple library university. That's why people feel so good when they come in um, is because of the hospitality, because of the commitment. And just really, and, and, and it's important again to know that the students were involved in all of this. The students did pro projects in which they, the carpet that you have on the floor is carpet that is specifically designed to be anti-cancerous because they were finding out that the glue on, on, in, on, on the rugs in many of the state bu buildings um, uh, caused cancer. And so uh, we talked with Mr. Mayor, God rest his soul, um, and got him to put in $500,000 more into the building to make sure we had carpets that if our babies laid down on them and we went to play with them on the carpet, we would not die. So, and, uh, and <laughs> it's important. And, and, and Dr. Parsons, again, an amazing man, Dr. Parsons, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Walter Nemec, and Lori Arnold and I were like kind of the design team. And we would go down to Seattle and we would sit in chairs because, uh, because they wanted to give us these little bitty chairs. And we kept saying, no, no, this, this, is, this is older black people. We, have, we, we need ample room when we sit down in these chairs. So, you know, you gotta give us some, you gotta give us some substance. So we sat from chair to chair. We took the carpet home and we threw red pop on it and coffee on it and everything else like that to see if it would stain. Um, and the students ran all these tests. The students figured out the colors. The reason why the colors you have on that campus is because somebody, some of the students took a color class and decided that for commuter students coming from long distances, it had to feel very, very comforting. And so that's why you have, we have all those browns and womb-like womb colors because we, they, they realized that they needed to have color in order to allow students to transition into learning and out of work. And so, so, um, so the campus was, um, so, so the campus was very intentionally designed, um, both um, in terms of ancient wisdom, traditional structures, recognizing the, the, the critical role of the circle, so nothing was ever locked down, so people could circle up, um, and it was quite, quite amazing. And then. Um, the last part that I want to talk about in terms of how the foundations of this story, and, um, and um, Trey, you can play the last little clip, please, um, is, uh, is the coming of the interbelly. It's going up. <laughs>
All right, so yeah, isn't that great? That was put, to, yes, that was put together by Laversa Sullivan. Let me say her name. Um, technological diva, genius, extraordinaire. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that the Tacoma campus has always been committed to the intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So we've always had some sort of youth program. And, um, and Laversa um, uh, uh, was the founder of the Intel Computer Clubhouse. And her kids and, and, and our students and Willie Parsons and everyone worked really, really closely together to do a science and after school science and math uh, uh, um, experience. And that was one of the products from La Versa's um, Clubhouse Kids. And what, the, and what that was uh, depicting was in 2002, um, Evergreen had a summer institute and everybody had to take it. It was called Math Across the Curriculum. And all the faculty were trying, we had to take it to try to figure out how to put math into our curriculum. So when we went to it, we were trying to say, okay, um, how do we put math? Um, again, we're always looking for where are we in the curriculum? Where, where is the math genius of black people? Um, and so we got into fractal, fractals and we got into um, patterning. And so then we found the Indabelli as an example of, uh, of, of mathematical um, fractalization and patterning. Um, and they are, a, uh, they are a nation of people in South Africa. So we said, okay, well, why don't we, um, why don't we uh, study the Indabelli? And then one of the students said, well, why don't we bring the Indabelli? And we said, oh, right. So we, so we decided to do the Indabelli wall painting project. So, and what that was, was a group of students worked together and they, in, and in the spring quarter, they did ethnographies. They went all around the, the hilltop community because one of the things that we wanted to do uh, was to re-image the hilltop, just as we had re-imaged um, uh, the, the population as being student worthy, stu as being student uh, rich. We wanted to make people to see that this community was more than notions of drugs and gangs and violence and all that kind of stuff. Because that's only one story. It's a, it's it, because the hilltop was, is a place um, of rich community and deep and deep 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 um, traditions. So the students went out and they researched organizations. They researched the Norwegian club, the 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 the, the, um, the Serbian club. They 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 talked to people from the synagogues. They talked to people from um, the NAACP. The urban League. They even talked to gang members and they asked everyone to give them a symbol that would describe who they are. Um, and, uh, and they were amazing symbols. Uh, uh, the synagogue discussion was a really um, important one for our students because they were de debating about whether or not they should get, put up a star of David or a minora. You know, and 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 the elders a bit, and the younger kind of church said, "Well, what's good to start David?" But the elders kind of maintained. They said, "No, at this time we need the notion of perseverance. We need the notion of faithfulness. We uh, we don't need the kind of aggressiveness." And so they so we have a minora on there. Um, with the um, the gang peoples um, even said. Um, um, said, we want to be on the wall, but we're tired of everybody looking at us going to jail. So there's a little symbol on the wall of a little gang member climbing stairs up to the sun, you know, ascending, getting out of the bad place and moving to the high place. So, and then uh, Elton Gatewood came, came in and taught the students how to do um, grant writing. So they wrote a grant to Paul Allen, and we got money from Paul Allen to bring the end of belly. So the end of belly came and, um, and, um, and um, they, uh, they work with the students to paint a mural on the outside of the building so that the building became a teaching tool both inside and out. And um, so, so I'm kind of, I, 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 um, I could go on, but, but that's essentially what I really wanted to share with you in terms of, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the Tacoma campus's um, eternal commitment to serve the community. Um, to represent the community, um, uh, to show, to both be a mirror and a window to the community, to show the community its gifts and its genius, and to and to also be a doorway that allows them people for uh, for um, um, to see themselves in their infinite possibility. Um, and so uh, I uh, I have been. Um, so blessed um, to be part of the Tacoma journey. Uh, I have been um, so blessed 
um, by, uh, um, by the fact, I, 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 I'm so blessed by the fact that we are in our third and fourth generation of community activists and community. When you go to something, three of the people on the mayors, on the, on the, on the mayor, on the city council are Tacoma graduates, you know, um, you right now, if you go to the hilltop and you see the young people who are who 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 are who are, who are, who are doing activism, who are doing community development, who are doing community graphics and stuff like that, those are evergreen babies. Either they are either they're kids of our graduates, or and they grew up on the campus, or they're somebody's relative. We have done what we came to do, and I charge you. Uh, Dr. Tater Runga, I charge you, Leah, I charge you, um, Lionel, I charge all of you to continue this legacy. We've gotten three generations. Let's go for four. Let's go for five. Let's go for six. It's all up to you. Ashe, Ashe, thank you for this journey. It's been fun. Woo. Ashe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hardiman. It's so good to see and hear from you again. James Robinson from Seattle. <laughs> hey. hey. Beautiful James Robinson. Good to see you too. Well, Leah, are we going to do a give back? I think this is a moment for us to just give Dr. Hardiman some praise, just like James did. Unmute yourself and just clap and thank her and tell her she's awesome. Woo! Oh! Oh! Woo! Yeah! Yeah! yeah. yeah. Thank you, Joy. Oh. Bless you, Joy. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Oh. Asante Sana. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Pa. Oh! Oh! Hey, Teresa. Hi, baby. <laughs> Talk to baby. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing as usual, Dr. Hardiman. What energy you poured out to us. Oh, you have said so many things that we are grateful that you are alive and well to, to, to give us this vital, vital information. I hope that people know this is a historic moment. Uh, Leah, are you with us? We should do a give back right away. I am here. Uh, let's see. Um, and remember, Dr. Hardiman is also the person who brought give back to I, us. I, I forgot so that. We have to do it right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if anyone who is familiar with give back would like to uh, demonstrate and go first, that would be fantastic. So if you just uh, raise a hand or um, speak up. And I wonder, oh, there's Tarasha. Go ahead. Hello, Tarasha. Hello, Dr. Arunga. So glad um, you're here. Go right ahead. Thank you. That was a really invigorating um, history lesson that you shared with us, Dr. Hardiman. It was very robust, informational, colorful, everything um, tactile, visually, um, that helps think the message and um, connect the dots on, you know, um, why I'm on this call and why I think others gravitate to Evergreen State College. So thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Um, also, you too, Dr. Lou Rochelle, I love what you spoke about as well. It was very um, informational, and I hope more of us are able to go with you on the trip with the three of y'all somewhere over on the continent. You'll be welcome, Tarasha. Thank you. Who would like to go next? All right. Do I see the administrator waving, waving a hand? Is that what I'm seeing? No? Okay. Is Dr. Orisha Day with us? We'd love to hear from her. She was on in the beginning, in the very, very, very beginning, but then she had to, but then she left. I don't know where she went. Okay. I but know I she had technical. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I'll so. go next, uh, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Uh, 
Dr. Joy, we have traveled all over the world together. Uh, we believe that if an airplane starts its engine, we are supposed to be on it. Yes. And I thought I knew the story of Evergreen Tacoma. But I learned so much today that I did not know. So thank you for that. I just, and the graphics, you know, we talk about technology. So I'm so proud of you for <laughs> <laughs> the visuals. So thank you. That was just fabulous. I, I invited people to come and I see that, that Dr. Arunga uh, recorded it. So I hope I'll be sending that out to all kinds of people to see that history. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You were fabulous. Thank you, thank you, yay. Thank you, all right, and who would like to go next? I'm gonna jump in here again real quick, uh, Dr. Joy Hardiman. Just wanted to say thank you again. I didn't have my camera up before because I was between two different laptops that were updating at the same time. Uh, but now that I've got the camera that's working, uh, I just wanna say thank you again. Um, from the very first time that I met you years ago as an undergrad at Antioch University when Dr. Marsha Tatarunga introduced me to you and she has been such a conduit to learning and to growth and to human development and the African experience for so many of us people here in Seattle. And again, thank you, Dr. Arunga, because without you and without your leadership and guidance as my elder, I would not know Dr. Joy Hardiman and Dr. Maxine Mims and um, Dr. Don Mason and so many others that you've brought into my life uh, and the elders who have had such a positive impact on my life and have helped me throughout the self-actualization process as an African young man and help me become accountable to my community and realize that my gifts are not just for me and for my own immediate surroundings, but for all of our community. And I'm honored to say that because of your leadership and, and, and your guidance, I am a college professor at Seattle Central College where um, I, again, you know, received that support and push from Dr. Arunga and I'm giving back to my community and the ways that I have always wanted to. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you again for your love, your kindness, your generosity, your wisdom, and your inspiration. It abounds so much more and so many than you realize. So thank you, God bless you, and I say. Oh, James, you can't know how proud we are to hear from you and to know what you're doing in the community. What a, what a true example of entering to learn, departing to serve. And it shows that it doesn't just happen at Evergreen, but as educators, we permeate many yes, institutions. Yes. I'm also re also working on my doctorate program, doctorate okay. degree. I got accepted into the doctorate of education program at Antioch, where I will be oh. focusing on improving oh. the education experience for black children and adults all over this country and all over the world. I do believe that there is a way to measure uh, the quality of education going out to our black children and adults. And I want to be a part of that process. And I want to be a part of, uh, of giving those resources and those skills to up and come educators so that we can stop this cycle of continuing to harm our children and our adults but to love them and and give them the strength and that self-actualization that they need because if I can do it if I can have access to wonderful leaders like you two then they can too and I want to be a part of that process so thank oh, you so that's much beautiful that's beautiful thank you what a sharing today do we have another give back for Dr. Hardiman? Yes, Mia. Mia would like to go next. Hi, hi. I would like to say um, thank you so much for that, that talk, that lecture. Um, I think something that I took away from that is, um, is a great example and lesson on intentionality. Um, you know, we're, I think we all strive to live with intention and purpose and um to be and it's always important to be able to constantly see examples on how to walk in that intention and purpose and i feel like your lecture was exactly that a great example of um of 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 intentionality and 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 um and just focus uh for for how the campus was built um and 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 the purpose behind it so i just want to say thank you for for that example and for um 
that's something that I can I can definitely take with me and use as an example moving forward. Thank you. Um, uh, Carolyn Prouty. Thanks. I was just, I thought I might just type it, but I'll just say quickly, Dr. J, it's so great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Runga as well. Um, I've really appreciated bringing our classes to, um, to the Tacoma campus from Olympia. And Dr. J, you've been so generous and giving history over and over. And now with this recording, um, it's captured. So I don't have to keep calling on you every time. <laughs> it's wonderful to know that this is all on film, uh, you know, that, that it's been recorded. So thank you for everything. And of course, all of the rich teaching um, and rich wisdom that's behind it. Thank you. And I still am available for tours. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> right, right. thank you. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Anytime, Carolyn. Well, I, I, Dr. Uh, Hardiman, just want to give you my, my heartfelt thanks. Uh, even me today, hearing you speak, it is uh, the first time I've heard many parts of this story. Uh, but one thing I know is clear, that without your life commitment and that of Dr. Mims, whom, who you so humbly put in front of you, even in your presentation, you grounded your presentation in how you came out of Dr. Mims. Uh, and I really want to give respect for that. Um, and just to say that this power is something that we now get the opportunity to build on. And the building that has yet to come is not just even in the Evergreen Tacoma campus. It's at Olympia, it's at Antioch, it's in the Pacific Northwest, it's in Africa. You have spread yourself and your knowledge beyond all of these demarcations. And you have given us a true gift of knowledge and insight. I truly think this has been a historical event today. And I love you and I thank you for all you have given to me and to our learning community today. All right, as we shift and we Okay. Is that a uh, Pam? Would you like that, that final word? That is Pam and Paris, Evergreen alum and Evergreen alum faculty. Yes. I just want to say that we are here. I'm just not quite presentable. I'm working on too many projects. So no I just have time to get dressed. But good morning and thank you for this knowledge. It is so <laughs> wonderful. Beautiful. So glad to have you always. Pam and Paris Bridges. This is what we know to be our Evergreen State College Tacoma Campus Sankofa community. Yes. And we bring each other life. We want to support each other. And by the way, congratulations. You had an amazing fundraiser performance this weekend virtually with your creative, beautiful, amazing daughter, Janae Bridges, who is a world-renowned opera singer. Thank you for bringing money to the pockets of our children who need more education in Tacoma. What foresight you also bring to us. So I, thank I thank you. you so much, but I do want to add that Janae Bridges, now renowned worldwide opera singer, is a product of Dr. Willie Parsons. She is a product yes. of Dr. Luversa Sullivan. She is a product of Dr. Joy Hardiman, Dr. Maxine Mims, Dr. Marsha Arunga. Mm -hmm. She is a village child. And uh, we certainly do, Tupac wants to partner with Evergreen and bring Harriet the Black Swan in the year of COVID-19 to the campus, to the community, However we can partner, we're here to do that. Thank you so much, Pam Bridges. We, we always want to partner with you. And I think the theme of today has really been about how community operates, because it is not just what we see on the surface. There is something that we stand on, and there is something, there is an arm in which we are pulling those behind us so that we can, they can stand on our shoulders. And Evergreen is a engine for doing that. 
And thank you so much, everyone. And I think I'm going to now go to our alumni because I think this is just an appropriate time to talk about the fruits of our labor. Angela Carlisle, who is our recent graduate of Evergreen State College. And really, I want to thank her just before she speaks as an alumni about social media because our social media, uh, as you see at Evergreen, Angela is a key part of that team. Angela, hello. We're going to give her a few moments before we hear from our author in residence, Teresa Stovall. Good morning. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, yeah, as Dr. Runga mentioned, I just graduated in June and I've been working with our recruitment team this summer on managing our Instagram and Facebook and you'll today's the first day of homeschool for my children so you might see them running around in the background so sorry for any distractions there um, so before I begin my presentation on Instagram I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about myself so I'm going to share my screen let's see just one moment sweetie just one. yes okay uh, Sorry. Hearing lucky sound. Okay, I'll go get him in a minute. Okay. Yeah, let me hear it. I know. Keep I have to go. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, I attended the Art Institute of Seattle um, and I studied fashion photography, and I grew up immersed in all types of art, but I really became drawn to photography in my early twenties. And over the past 12 years um, working as a photographer, I've found that I am the happiest and most inspired and I really do my best work when I am on set with all women. So I've built a team of exclusively women and we create original brand content for um, uh, businesses that are primarily female owned. And we strive to tell a story with the images that we produce and bring clo viewers close to the brand and connect with them on an emotional level. And that can be a little challenging, but um, it requires us to know what our target audience is, uh, bring our clients, listening to our clients and working with companies that we believe in. So why did I go back to school? So in 2016, I started feeling like I needed to be doing something more meaningful with my work and connect more with my community. So I started a personal project called Voices She Carries, as you can see here, um, that was centered around women and their stories and how we shape one another. And it was born out of my desire to share how women sharing their stories with me over many years of photographing them began to reshape my internal dialogue and relationships with other women. I was really excited about this project. Um, I was working on it nonstop, but it wasn't really getting to a place where it was being shown in the community. It wasn't growing past just me collecting these images and um, interviews. So I decided that it was probably time to go back to school. And after a lot of research, I decided to attend Evergreen. So why Evergreen? Um, Evergreen allowed me to explore my studies through an artistic lens. Because it was interdisciplinary, I was allowed to incorporate my art into virtually all of my projects. Um, but what the most important thing that I was able to focus on was the why behind the work that I was doing. That was really transformative for the project and for me personally. And I was encouraged and supported every step of the way. I finalized the first iteration of Voices She Carries um, as my capstone project. And the final project includes audio of the women's stories combined with their portraits. And I was able to share the project at our virtual spring fair, which was very exciting and a wonderful way to show the public for the first time something that was so close to my heart. Um, so I'm very grateful for the support that I received at Evergreen and having not, Evergreen's not an art school, I had been to art school, but it helped me um, examine my work in ways that being in school had never allowed me to. So I'm very grateful. If you're interested in hearing more about Voices She Carries or even participating, please reach out. Um, I've included my contact information at the end. So now let's talk about Instagram. Okay, 
So why should your business be on social media and in particular Instagram? I have notes here, sorry. So Instagram's a snapshot of your business um, and what you offer. For me, my business, I'm selling a service and my product um, are primarily digital images, but you could be selling a service, a physical product, you could be raising awareness about a cause or promoting an event. In all of these instances, Instagram is a tool that can help you be seen, especially now with the world being all online. I think it's really important to have a presence online and as many outlets as possible for your business. In one look, Instagram gives you um, a way to connect with your audiences and let them know your story. And it's really easy to use um, once you explore it a bit and it's free. Okay, so what to post. This is the question that I think people ask the most and it can honestly be the hardest thing to decide in the beginning. When we started Evergreen's account at the beginning of the summer, we had certain posts that we knew that we wanted to share. We wanted to tell the history of Evergreen, show our connection to the community, and show prospective students what we offered. I created a content calendar and had a few months worth of content included. This is really helpful in the beginning if you know what your goals are. It helps you stay on track with your posts and helps you prepare for the future. So you can prep images and quotes ahead of time so you know on what date you'll be posting what. Uh, consistently posting gives your audience something to look forward to and over time, again, it will tell your story. It's also important to have a style. Think of the colors that you're using, fonts, the overall look that you're creating in your grid because Instagram shows up in this grid pattern. And I have two examples here, evergreen, you see lots of green. And then this other um, post is confetti party boxes and she uses bright colors, um, but you still see consistency there. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important to be mindful of current events. Um, and when relevant, you should post something. Despite having the calendar and following it most of the time, I think there are certain events that are important to acknowledge. And if you do post something that comments on, event, on an event, um, it shouldn't feel out of nowhere for your audience. So they're getting to know you and your brand. So it's important to be authentic the whole, like all along. I also like to mix in personal moments. Um, in today's world, it does matter who's behind the brand. And like I said earlier, I like working with brands that I believe in, but I also like buying from people that I feel connected to. Um, and now this is easy for me to say because I'm a photographer, but I think that when possible to use professional images, um, it can elevate your the look of your grid and your account, but also today's phones take excellent photos and you can get an editing app and make your photos uh, appear pretty consistent. And if you are going to be taking your own photos and styling them yourself, I have some photo tips. Okay, so I think that really clean, simple images read really well um, because they show up in that grid pattern. This is from my Instagram account. You can see that there's pretty similar colors. Um, it's not to say that I only post photos that have whites and pinks in them, but if I'm switching to a different color pattern, I slowly do that. So when you look at the grid, it looks pretty consistent. Um, you can also use um, a photo editing app. I use Visco on my computer and they also have an app. Um, and also the Instagram app has built in filters. So if you find a filter that you like that tends to go with your style, you could edit them consistently on that and then your grid will appear really pretty and really well thought out, which is important for creating your brand. Okay, so if you're going to all this trouble, then you probably wanna get noticed. Um, and pretty much every business seems like it's on Instagram. So how do you do this? The first thing, you would want to do is use hashtags. This is pretty well known. And so a hashtag is something that you put after the description of your photo, or if you've written a quote, anything that you, 
is your text, you add hashtags after. Um, these are important because they categorize your photo on Instagram. So if you're struggling with what to start with, you can look at other companies that are similar to yours or people who are posting content like yours and see what tags they're using and what's getting them seen. It's a good place to start. Um, hashtags can help your posts be seen by people that don't follow you because it categorizes it. So for me, I would tag almost every one of my photos with hashtag Seattle photographer. So then I, that photo goes into the queue of Seattle photographers. Now, if my photo gets 300 likes and someone else who has also used that hashtag gets 500 likes, then their hashtag will, their photo will show above mine when looking for that hashtag. So it's important to use a variety of hashtags um, whenever you're posting. And I would say you can post five to seven seems like a reasonable amount each time that you post. Okay, so, and this can be challenging at the beginning. You wanna get liked, you wanna get noticed, Do you wanna have comments, all of these things help you be seen. So I encourage you to reach out to your existing clients, your fan base that you already have, your friends and your family and ask them for their support. Um, getting them to like, comment and share your post is really helpful. You can also pay for a boosting service. So if you would like, you can, there are automated services that when you post something, you will get automatic likes um, and sometimes comments, depending on what service you choose on your post. This can help you look really established, especially if you're new to Instagram, if you don't have much of a following and establish yourself right away. Um, prices range from, for boosting services, about $50 and up per month. And you can change how much you how much of a service that you would like. So you could be really aggressive with that in the beginning and then taper down as you build your following. Um, another great way to build your following and gain support is to tag community partners. So if you are posting something and um, you're collaborating with um, someone in the community, you can tag them and then that will give them a notification a notification that they have been tagged and then they're more likely to share it. So they're sharing it with someone that's in their fan base that may not be in yours. They might see you and just decide to start following you because you you have a shared interest. Okay, and then Instagram etiquette. etiquette. So um, it's important that you respond to comments and messages when you um, receive something on Instagram. There's a little heart next to comments that you can just click that says, hi, I like that you commented on this. And you can also respond. Um, I rarely get messages anymore through my actual website. Um, Instagram has basically replaced that for my business. And so I get booked and inquiries through there now. And so it's really important that if you start getting those messages um, that you respond and also support others. If you find that there's someone in the community or you have a fan that's always liking and always commenting, like and comment back to them. That just shows that you're grateful to them um, for their support. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna talk about are Linktree and stories. Um, so Linktree is um, something that we use at Evergreen because in, um, on Instagram, you, right, you can see right here this link tree, you are normally allowed to only have one link to a website. So you can only show one site. But for Evergreen, we wanted to show multiple sites. So I'm going to show you see here. So if you clicked on this right here, our link tree, you are brought to this page. This allows someone say that they've been following us and they're like, I really wanna check this out. You can visit the website. There's a direct link to the virtual series because we post about the virtual series so much. This would make it really easy for them to join us today. Uh, Facebook page and then YouTube channel, Longhouse, everything is right here. And you can have as many as you'd like. This is also a free service. Um, if you're wanting something really basic like this, and I've included the link to Linktree at the end of the presentation, if you'd like to do that. 
Um, and so oh, I'm trying to get to it. So like if you clicked on the Facebook page, then you would be at, it's an easy way to connect all of your accounts and people like things that are easy. So easy to go from one site to the other. Okay. And the last thing I want to cover are Instagram stories. Where are we? Um, so stories are something that I use to post more personal content. So this is my Instagram account. And I mainly keep these, you know, professional photos that I've done for other brands. Um, I do mix in, like I said, some personal photos here, some graphics, things that I believe in. Um, but I love my children and I like showing pictures of them. And I also want people to know that there's a person, a working mom behind um, my business. So it's a really great way to connect on a more personal level with your clients. So if you go here, this is where your stories would show up. And then you can also favorite them. Um, you highlight them and then they show up down here. So I have lots of my boys um, pictures down here, Eli and Gus, my studios, and it's a way to categorize the stories that you love and you wanna go back and look at. Um, I would say that people browse stories um, quite often and you can you can add hashtags and locations to them. And it's, it's just a really, um, it's another way to share something. For Evergreen, we also use stories because we post a lot of uh, virtual lecture series, we have um, recruitment uh, posts, and they all have sort of a similar look. So I wouldn't want someone to open this page and just see advertisements. Um, that's not as interesting. So I will post our events here once, but then I'll post them multiple times in our stories. You can add graphics right from the app. Um, it's really easy when you're adding. I have also added things that um, our alumni has been doing. I added this week, Poor People's Campaign had an event and then today's event. So, and you can just keep adding to them. And it's a great way also for your audience to see what you've been doing. Um, so not just what you're doing currently, but it, a really fast way to go through the, the events that you've had. Okay, and let me move this back up. And our last page, this is just resources for you. Um, like I mentioned earlier, photo editing from Visco, um, that's what I use, but there are a lot of free apps out there. The boosting service that we've been using for Instagram on um, for Evergreen, we've been using InstaRabbit. Again, there are quite a few others out there. I do think this has been a really reliable service, so this is something that I would definitely recommend. And then Linktree. So that would allow you to link multiple sites if you're managing different things. If you'd like to connect with us on Instagram, which I would love to see you there, here's our Evergreen account. And then this is my, my Instagram website and my email if you'd like to reach out over Voice That She Carries or if you have any questions if you're starting your account and you're not sure how to get started. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angela. That's that, what a beautiful presentation. And I hope that people see the connection between branding and what Dr. Hardiman was doing and what we are called upon to do now during COVID times. Uh, you are a treasure to us because you came with that knowledge as a student. And now we rely on you in COVID times to communicate to our, our population and to make us look good. So I want everyone to think about what ways we could use these kinds of, of skills in our own lives, which ways we can communicate to people, uh, begin to sell products, share what we're doing, and never forget to say thank you. I think that's what the likes are all about. So that is uh, so valuable. And we will come back to you, Angela, very uh, shortly with questions if you have them. But now we're going to move to our author in residence. And we're so grateful to have you, Teresa Stovall, author of nine books, uh, a graduate uh, alumni of Evergreen State College. Thank you for being our author in residence. You have set a great example for the future. Please address us today. 
Hello, everybody. I'm coming to you from the ATL. So it's afternoon here. Good morning to my family. This is, I just want to open with my give back to Dr. Joy Hardiman, whom I fondly describe as my former professor, lifelong mentor, and cherished friend on every level. And it's so funny because I became a student today when she was speaking. I have notes. And <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, grabbed the pen and paper. I was like, oh yeah, she's talking, I'm writing. And I just, so I'm just thrilled. I know many of you know her and have had the honor of working with her. Um, but for those who haven't, I, this is just a glimpse of the amazing. And I've been working with her for, I shouldn't tell this since, you know, we're both so young, but I did the math, uh, 42 years. <laughs> 42 years, Ashe, right? And, um, and, and the, the teachings of both Dr. Hardiman and Dr. Mims, and ironically, Dr. Tater Runga, who was a contemporary of mine, so she wasn't a teacher. We were just in, went through many phases of life together. Um, all of them have been teachers, and not just teachers, but the kind of lessons that you don't just take notes on, but then embed themselves deeply into your subconscious and become so much a part of you that when those voices bubble up for guidance or reassurance or or inspiration, you're not quite sure if it's them talking or you. And that's the beauty of the Tacoma experience and the, the, the synthesis and the integration of it all that I think Dr. Joy was so beautifully describing. So now let's talk about writing. This is the fourth of five work, mini workshops I'm doing. I have a really special guest and he took a minute off of work to be with us today, so I'm super excited and grateful. So this is Finding Your Voice. Trey, do we have slides? finding your voice um, and you know finding your voice in specifically in a writing context and this is designed specifically for the students of evergreen who will be as as dr uh, hardeman explained doing an autobiographical project i just spent i've been a writer my whole life and i just spent five excruciatingly wonderful years writing a memoir <laughs> so you know um finding your voice even if you're used to putting your voice out there is is always a challenge always a joy and always a process of kind of initiation so this is week four in finding your voice and this is how, ways that we're going to make yourself available and visible to your own inner voice and just so you know what i'm what i'm sharing here are what i call pro tips from other myself and other professional writers and tricks of the trade so these are things that we do no matter how experienced we are no matter how accomplished we are to bring our own writing to life and to keep growing and evolving as writers in whatever realms we're in. Thank you, Trevor. Mm -hmm. So let's start talking about how, what defines you and how do you describe yourself? I just want you to play a little bit here. How do you describe yourself to yourself? How do you describe yourself to other people? Whether you're introducing yourself for the first time, whether you, somebody asks you to write a biographical statement, whether you're, on social media, creating a LinkedIn account, doing a profile on, you know, Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever else there is out there, TikTok, Snapchat, you know, how do you, who are you and who are you to yourself? And then who is it you, you present to other people? I just want you to kind of think about that and play right down to the top of your head. What are the top five adjectives? If I said to you, give me the top five adjectives you want to describe you, or you only get five. What are your top five? right? That's another way to just kind of again play with it. Play with it. What are your top five, your second five? You know, how do other people describe you? And do you feel the way they describe you is in alignment with the way you see yourself? That's always an interesting question. You can even do a social media post. Describe me in five words, right? And see what you get. See what you get. You know, when you teach, you get student evaluations. And at Evergreen, I don't know, I'm assuming they still do this. You get evaluation. Everybody evaluates everybody. This is evaluation heaven. But I have to tell you that um, a couple of years ago, I got my transcripts. I went to the University of Washington for two years and graduated from Evergreen Tacoma. And I have to tell you, it's one thing to look at a transcript from a traditional school with a bunch of numbers, courses you may or may not remember taking, and those Evergreen evaluations, to read them decades later is an incredible experience. I'm just, that's my plug for Evergreen. But um, 
And what and who influenced how you see yourself? Where does that come from? We all have been influenced from birth by our families, our communities, sometimes you know, media content, our teachers, our, our um, friends, our colleagues. So all those things, start describing yourself from all those perspectives and see what you come up with and see what kind of voice might emerge from there. So I want to now to introduce our special guest, who I'm so grateful he's taken a minute from his workday to be with us, also Atlanta-based, but from New York. Okay, Mark, Mario Anthony Reyes, we call him Papi Picasso, is an amazing writer, poet, and personality. Real quick, I met him last year um, in Atlanta at a tribute to one of my all-time favorite icons, artists, and people. Gil Scott Heron. So it was a wonderful community gathering to honor Gil Scott Heron, who had passed away. And um, he passed away in 2011. And um, Mario, I think, was the last poet to go. I had never heard of him, had never seen him, but he kind of jumped up on the stage and had that electric New York City energy that you don't ever see anywhere else, and a lot of Bronx swag. And, but beyond all that, his poetry was incredible. His poetry was incredible. So we applauded him and, you know, hooped and hollered. And then I was there with my home girl, T.O. Grigsby, Teresa Grigsby from Seattle. And um, she had some recent, you know, health, health procedures done. So we were leaving and going outside and it's dark. It's, you know, right just a couple blocks um, east of downtown Atlanta. And we're both waiting for our Ubers. And our Uber has to take me far away because I live in the suburbs, she lives in the city. So we were, and then um, Mr. Reyes comes out. So we greeted him and introduced ourselves and again, told him how much we really loved his work, exchanged some social media in, um, information. And that was that, you know, but again, he just really made a strong impression because of his voice, both his voice, his written voice, and then just how he communicates. And what really struck me though, was that my Uber came first. And I had to leave my home girl there, you know? And again, it's 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, um, an area that we like to call in development, right? And I was a little nervous, but he was there and he kind of just gave me a look. And he was like, I got this. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, a good home training, this is beautiful. And I was able to go off and, you know, T texted me that she got home safely and he was a gentleman and they had a beautiful conversation. So you, of course, he won my heart on yet another level. So we've been social media buzz for a while. And um, a couple months ago, he came out with a book, poppypicassopoetry.com is where you can get the book. And I'm strongly recommending you do, especially if you're following this series I'm doing and if you're a student of developing your voice. So I didn't know what, <laughs> I didn't know what, um, his voice was going to be like. I knew his poetry, but I didn't know. I didn't know if it was going to be a book of poetry. But what he's done is he's beautifully blended poetry and prose in his unique voice, and um, to really communicate his story. In this case, the story about his relationship with his son and his children. He is a devoted father, and so. I got the book a couple uh, months ago, you know, it got out of quarantine because I quarantine everything. And um, I popped it open right when I was starting to prepare. Dr. Runga had just called and asked me to do this, this series. And I was looking for examples of voice and I literally um, opened the book to the preface, read the first paragraph and it knocked my shoes and my socks and my earrings off. I mean, it was one paragraph and I was done. And in the book publishing world, by the way, and you know, the, I don't know how his book was published, but in the book publishing world, one of the things you learn is that your book sale to a literary agent, to a publishing house, and later on to an audience, people make decisions in the first paragraph. So we authors will kill ourselves over that first paragraph. We'll write the whole other book and then we will go back again and again and again. Um, you know, to write that first paragraph. His first paragraph knocked all my socks and everything else off and I was done. So, Trey, can we please see the next slide? And I want to introduce you to Mario Anthony Reyes, AKA Poppy Picasso. He's blessing us with his presence and I would love for him to read the paragraph in his unique voice. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Teresa. Can you guys hear me? 
Outstanding, outstanding. Thank you so much. I I remember that day very fondly, and the pleasure was obviously all mine. And I'll be sure to let my mother know that you said I was raised with some sense, and she'll be super <laughs> happy to hear that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just start off by reading the uh, paragraph. I am of Generation X, a proud New Yorkian born in the Bronx in 1980. I'm a product of Yo! MTV Raps, Saturday morning cartoons, bootleg movies from the barbershop, and hitching rides on the back of the city bus. I do not recommend anybody try that. Um, the first song I ever memorized was a children's story by Slick Rick. My best friend counted aloud the seconds of my first kiss. I stole candy after school, rode bikes with the card in the spoke, and ate dinner at the table with the television off. I hailed from a household that had a surplus of love to extend down 13 flights that would make the hardest thug offer to carry up the groceries. Thank you, Mario. Again, I really do recommend the book and that's why I put the website again, poppypicassopoetry.com. Thank you so much for blessing us. I could have never read it like that. Now y'all got the Bronx flavor and everything else. But the point is I want us to all just take a minute and read this with our eyes since we got the treat of hearing it with our ears. Take a minute and read this paragraph and let's talk about the things we've talked about in previous weeks. Let's just take a minute of silence and everybody read it. So if you are a student of voice, um, I would get the book, print this out, put it on the wall. Like seriously, it's that good. So let's talk about what he does. We've talked in previous weeks about showing, not telling. Can you see this? Can you see this with his words? Yeah, somebody, y'all can unmute and holler if you want. Um, yes, can you see this, right? Can you, can you? Can you hear the MTV raps and the and the cartoons and I the, the and the card and the spokes? Hmm? I love the card and the spokes. I did that as a kid. <laughs> right? And that tells you like that's a whole chapter right there. Yeah. Card and the card and the spokes is a whole chapter, right? I um like New York Rican. I love that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I mean, it just table with the television off. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, <laughs> but doesn't again? That's all. Is that not a whole chapter? Those five or six words mm -hmm. that tells you a whole lot right there, right? It tells you he came from a good, strong family. There was a lot of love. He did youthful shenanigans, but clearly had good sense while while you know indulging in the normal kind of youthful shenanigans. Uh, but that 13 flights, hardest thug, that's just, I was, I'm still on the floor over that one. I'm still on the floor over that. Like, again, and we talked last week about writing with your senses, right? All of your senses, sight and sound and touch and taste and even fragrance. I mean, I can, I can smell the back of the city bus, you know, shout out New York City. Uh, <laughs> right? But you can... Yes, yes. The cultural specificity. And as Dr. Joy Hardiman taught me, yo, those many years ago, to be universal, you have to be specific. To connect, the more specific you are. Even if people aren't aware of what you're talking about, even if their cultural background, where they're from, they don't, you know, people could be reading this from another part of the world and not know specifically these references, but the energy still comes through. If you remember the first week we used a song, um, Every Ghetto, Every City, from the iconic Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Again, she has such specificity. And even when the song came out, I lived in South Jersey, she was talking about North Jersey. I didn't know all those references at the time the song came out. It still communicated, it still hit me in every sense that I had, you know, beef patty, cocoa bread, all of it. And so that's what Mario has done here. And again, I just, I couldn't wait to share this, this paragraph with you. And I'm so honored he's with us because this is what you can do. And 
again, I really do recommend the whole book because it's it's an awesome book and it's it's a very creative blend of talking about your own story, being a parent, being a, a black Puerto Rican, raising black children in Atlanta in 2020, right? All of those things that are very real and, and very visceral. So th this is an example of voice achieved, I would say flawlessly, right? As is the whole book. Okay, Trey. So this is your assignment. Um, and then I want us to talk a little bit. I made the slides short this week. And if you want to bring Mario in, if he's still able to be with us, if you have any questions or give back for him, I think we should start with. But this is your assignment, okay? Take his paragraph um, and do something similar. You can even copy, you can even copy the rhythm of it, the vibe of it, right? Just to get your, your juices flowing, to sum up key sensory details about yourself. And you've only got one paragraph. This is like when all of us who were used to writing dissertations on Facebook first got on Twitter. And remember, would you have 140 characters or something? It was crazy. And you could like, I can't write. You, you try to write and it would get cut off. One paragraph, you got one paragraph to tell the world, not your whole life story, but to do what he did. He did, you know, like his paragraph was, was to me, was like a film, like a, a scene in a film, a movie, right? That they, it was a close, it, a super close Zoom. It was an extreme close-up. It was an extreme close-up with key sensory details. That's the words I want you to play with. Key sensory details. You know, what would tell somebody where you're from, right? Like I'm from Seattle. I live in Atlanta. I say ginger and sour balls to people here. And they, they're like, I'm sorry, what? My own children, you know, didn't, they were like, what is that? No, oh, that tastes horrible. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is ginger and sour balls. Eat it. You know, because but every place in the world has something, every culture, every family, every community has specific things. What are the sensory details that tell the world who you are if you have only one paragraph? So I want you, I want you to play with that, tickle your muse, remember to court and seduce and nurture your muse when you find them, right? And get to know your muse because you can't rely on your muse for all writing, but you do need your muse to, for inspiration and for juice and for sizzle, right? The kind of sizzle you saw in, in Mario's writing. So I'd like to start by giving Mario a give back. And if that's okay with Dr. Runga to open, um, open up for some give back for Mario Anthony Reyes, Poppy Picasso. Her awesome work and being just an, a beautiful person and an amazing artist and dad. Thank you and so much. Look, I'd like to do a give back. Hey, restore the screen, please. Tired of waiting on the phone? You can apply for benefits, submit weekly claims, and find a lot of information about you. Okay, that's not me. <laughs> um, Mario, I just want to thank you for that last sentence. Um, that image of, uh, uh, um, I mean, it was so visually graphic. I could feel the, the love radiating from 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 wherever the uh, from the top of the stairs where the people watch TV with what had dinner without TV, which was you know which was uh, what was was amazing. But but when you talked about it uh, about that that love was so vibrant, you could visually see it coming down the stairs. You could really visually see a light, uh, like a sunlight, a sun ray coming down the stairs. And and I know those thugs. I mean, I'm from Buffalo, New York, so I um uh, I. I, I know East Coast a little bit, you know. Um, we're the other New York, um, but but it was so powerful. So I want to thank you for that because it said so much. And I really love um, Teresa how you talked about how one image, one sentence could be a whole paragraph, could be a whole novel. That last sentence, I, I want to know who those people are. I want to know um, what the thugs were thinking when they were carrying up those groceries. I want to know, did people get, what landing did they stop at? You know, um, I want to know all those things. So thank you. Thank you for that delightful uh, trip of my, for my imagination. Sure. Um, it's funny because one of the things that I really love is like how palpable the love from my household is. Um, growing up in that community, that love was so strong, it kind of created almost like a bubble around me in which even those thugs and the people that were going wayward still wanted to preserve my integrity and my innocence 
while they were not giving and affording that same luxury to my friends. And, you know, a lot of those people had very, like, you know, they have good hearts. They just got, like we said, uh, they, they just got taken in a different direction and some very interesting characters and some people I still love to this day. I'll write them in jail, but I won't uh, <laughs> join them. <laughs> right. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I also want to send out some thanks as I was reading so many memories from my childhood came back because I'm the youngest in my sibling line. Um, so I recall having older brothers who hung out with the thugs and all of that. Um, but we come from a Christian, a Southern Baptist Christian family. Uh, so they knew that their lifestyle was considered antithetical to the principles that we grew up with. So when they would come to our house to come, you know, hang out with my older brothers or whatnot, there was a certain level of respect that dissipated that hard shell around them that everyone else within our community were used to seeing from them. But when they showed up to our front door and my mother answered the door, hey, Miss Tina, how are you doing today? Is there anything, you know, that, that was, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you know what's up. Turning the television off during dinner time, the big old box TVs from the 90s came back to mind, right? That mm -hmm. was when we had the big box TVs back in the day. So it wasn't like the big, you know, I don't know how many inches of screens of, of TV people, you know, typically have today. But back then, the TV could only be seen from one room because it wasn't big enough to be seen from the kitchen or from the foyer or another place in the house, you know. So when dinner time was going on, they didn't want the noise in the background. It was coming from a room where you couldn't see the TV anyway. So turn that off, right? This is our time to be together as a family. So just so many memories came flooding back. So again, thank you so much for your artistry, for the love that you inject into your artistry and for the thank courage you. to share your artistry with the community. Thank you so much, I appreciate you. Uh, no problem, it's funny. Uh, one thing that I wanted to uh, say and respond to is how um, I've done a lot of, when I was in Baltimore and Atlanta, I've done a lot of nonprofit work. And what I noticed is it's not that they're unwilling to receive the love or the guidance, it's consistency that's the problem. And when you are a part of a community, by virtue of just existing, you become consistent and you become the example. And then you become essentially what the talented 10th was supposed to represent. And when you're able to actually demonstrate by virtue of existence and just genuine love, like, hey, yeah, come upstairs. You can eat with us at 6 p.m., 6.30, because you know what time we eat every day. You know we're going to pray before we eat. You know um, we'll sit down and we could talk to you about whatever issues are going on in your home. You actually then assume a role of like a community director or a counselor. That's really true. And that goes all the way back to Dr. Mims's kitchen table, doesn't it? It goes all the way back, full circle. Full circle. Any more, any more love for Mario? Yes, get the book. I'm serious. PoppyPicassoPoetry.com. Again, it's not only an exquisite example of voice, really highly evolved, but still completely grassroots and very relatable, very emotional, very moving. Um, it's also just extraordinarily well done and and he brings so much much love to the to the community and to and to the world that i think it's it's definitely i, I highly recommend it i think you'll enjoy it Follow anybody him that's interested in uh high-end art you can see it behind me the art that was done was done by mr charlie palmer he recently had a time magazine july cover he yes. recently did john legend's album cover so for it being an independent project, we have a lot of uh, big hitters that just wanted to contribute because it was just a uh, labor of love. So thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Ashe, thank you for thank joining you, us. Mario. I just want to say welcome to Evergreen State College, Tacoma. When you are in town, you know you got to stop in. For sure. And for sure. I I also want to say that the, the home you talk about is the kind of environment that I think Dr. Hardiman was trying to create 
at Evergreen State College. And the, it's the kind of home that we call a hub today where we just want people to gravitate to Evergreen as a place where they, they're curious, where they want to satisfy their, their inquiry, where we want to get into a dialogue about love and, and how we move to the next level post COVID. Um, and, so, and you are welcome to join us. For you, Teresa, you brought to us a real um, thinking about voice. You actually brought us a person with a voice today. So <laughs> I want to honor you for that. But, you know, I think that what you are showing us is that we have inside of us what we are looking for to be the writer that we are. That it's, it's like the red shoes, right? Everybody mute your, um, your uh, microphone, please. Um, it is like the red shoes in uh, Wizard of Oz where she goes on this whole journey and in our, in our school earlier last year, we read The Alchemist, a similar journey, life journey, where you're looking for the truth. And guess what? That truth is right there in your heart, right there around you where you never left home. And Mario reminded us that that is really what we're all looking for. And we hope that you will find that also at Evergreen. This is what we're trying to create. And if you got that, and I love the, these, these connections being made today. If you got that, then you really uh, got a holistic picture of what we're trying to achieve with the virtual lecture series. If Are you there have any idea how important The Alchemist was to me when I first read it? And then for you to even source that as it pertained to me and my writing, that was, that, was, that was a homecoming in itself. Yes, yes. The Alchemist is a very important book. I hope that we'll use that. I'm not sure that's on our book list this year, but we have some other amazing books. And we should have a book uh, list coming up very soon um, in our newsletter. We'd love you to contribute a few books to that list, Mario, including the one of, that is your own. So please keep that in mind. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to take a moment to see if there are any questions to ask Teresa, uh, to ask Mario or Dr. Hardiman, who have been our wonderful presenters today. Uh, hi, this is Pam Bridges. Hi, hi Mario. Pam. Hey, how you doing? I just want to bring you greetings from Tacoma by way of West Baltimore. That's my home. So I just had to give a shout out to Baltimore. <laughs> Baltimore for 13 years. That was right. a, uh, a, a, a rich experience in my life. I love that city dearly. Absolutely. So uh, do you have any references in your book about Baltimore? Oh, for sure. A lot, actually. Um, I lived off of Exit 17 by uh, Security Boulevard at first. Wow. Before I moved downtown where the towers used to stand, yes. that, uh, gentrified the neighborhood. And I give very detailed uh, and vivid pictures of what it was like trying to be the liaison and the bridge between the culture that was there and the new, um, for lack of a better term, invading culture. Yes. And I would be the one hosting. I would get, you know, I think a lot of times it's a matter of uh, failure to communicate. So what I would do is give everybody the best part of me. And instead of trying to live in a bubble, I let allow them to play with my kids, the kids in the neighborhood. I would watch them and, as they would uh, play in the uh, courtyard and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't never look at it like it's, it's something to be uh, applauded. That was just, you know, as I said, I miss growing up like that in my neighborhood. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, Baltimore's lit it in. Actually, there's one, the race chapter. I speak specifically about being in Fells Point. And, you know, right across the street from CFG Bank, there's that um, building owned by an artist. Oh, and yes, the one with all the glass on it? Yep, exactly. Yes. He yes. got, like, the phones inside, and he made, a, like, a, a phone closet. Right, I got and to it, meet him. I was actually walking in Fells Point and met him. Yeah, yeah he's an amazing dude. Yeah. And one of the uh, things that hits is he had these big placards, red placards that covered up every window that said, America Stop Killing Black Men. And it had the name of another black man that was killed by police. Ah. Now, as my son and I were walking out of the bank, he looks at it and says, Daddy, why do they want to kill us? 
parents. And I had to have this conversation with a third grader ah. as to the complexities of uh, race and uh, policing in America. And on that note, because now it is 12 noon, and yeah. by the way, that is an ongoing conversation that we want to be courageous enough to have uh, in the fall quarter. Next week, we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Maxine Mims. Please tell everyone, we want to get everyone right on this screen to hear our final fifth week lecture series right here on the same channel and uh, tell everyone about it so that we can have an incredible final virtual lecture series. I want to thank everyone who came to visit us and Leah will be available in a chat room with Teresa and I think Mario will be there for a few minutes as well. Feel free to, con uh, to join that chat room for a further conversation. Mm -hmm.